planet Uranus was discovered almost accidentally by a then amateur astronomer named William Herschel in 1781. Uranus has remained a mystery ever since. Millions of bits of data were collected at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory from Voyager's encounter with the planet. And this data has revealed some amazing secrets of the most bizarre planet in our solar system. Uranus is interesting to astronomers for many reasons. The first and most obvious is that the planet is tilted on its side. That is, its south pole faces the sun rather than its equator. This can be clearly seen by the position of the delicate Uranian ring structure. Why Uranus is tilted over 90 degrees on its axis, no one knows for certain. Though it appears that during the early formation of the planets, Uranus must have had a catastrophic collision with an object at least planet-sized, which caused it to tilt so violently. Ejecta from this collision probably formed the five large satellites that orbit the planet, as well as the ten smaller moons and the ring structure as well. Uranus lies two billion miles away from the Earth, and as such, light falling on the planet from the sun is extremely dim. Voyager was built to go by Jupiter and Saturn. It was put on a trajectory that would take it by the outer planets, but without the funding to ensure that the mission would go on that long. And the spacecraft itself was only designed to go by Jupiter and Saturn. What that means is that we have uh, an infrared detector and the cameras, which are really straining out in this cold, dark environment to get data. And what that means is that we have to do what's called image motion compensation. We track our target so that while the shutters are open on the cameras, um, we are tracking what we're trying to take the picture of. Uranus is about four times the size of Earth. It also appears that the seventh planet from the Sun has a rocky core about the size of Earth that is surrounded by a sea of liquid water, a sea totally unlike anything with which we are familiar on Earth. This ocean, which is larger than the entire planet Earth, is compressed so much by the forces of gravity that it actually becomes electrically conductive. That is, it generates its own electrical fields. At the higher regions, where the water is frozen into ice, it is so cold that the ice is as hard as steel. This ocean produces two interesting features of Uranus. The first is a strange magnetic field which rotates in a highly irregular orbit about the planet. And this magnetic field, in turn, creates what scientists call electroglow. Uranus sits in space with an eerie, nebulous glow surrounding the entire sphere. It's, we know one thing, is magnetic field is very strange. Instead of being aligned more or less with the spin direction of the planet, as most of the other magnetic fields we've seen in the solar system are, it's tilted by 56 degrees, 59 degrees, almost 60 degrees, uh, meaning that it, uh, as, the, as the planet rotates this way, the magnetic field goes around like this. And there are a lot of theories just being developed now based on the Voyager data as to what's going on here. One possibility is that this magnetic field is in the process of changing its polarity as the Earth's field does every few, ten, few thousand to ten thousand years. And we just happen to catch it in an unusual state. Even though the sun is always shining on the south pole of the planet, the temperature of its atmosphere is constant from north to south. It has huge weather systems, much like Jupiter and Saturn, though they are harder to photograph due in part to the fact that the atmosphere of Uranus is comprised mostly of methane and ammonia, which reflect light in a very similar fashion. The moons of Uranus are one of its most striking features. There are five large moons and at least ten smaller moons. It is these smaller moons that we believe act as shepherds within the rings. The gravity exerted by these moons keeps the rings of Uranus aligned in an orderly fashion. The five large moons are all made up of water ice, with perhaps hot rocky cores. There is Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, Oberon, and last but certainly not least, Miranda. Most of these moons show signs of recent geologic activity. 
Of these large moons, Miranda is by far the most remarkable. Its surface appears as though someone took a cosmic-sized broom and swept across its face. You'd think that a lot of these small icy satellites would all look the same. Every time we go to one of these places, we find that, that every one of them has its own distinct character. I think the, the star of the Uranus system is the innermost of the larger satellites, Miranda. It's got a surface on it that's a, a, a sort of a hodgepodge of things we've seen at other icy planets. Instead of just being uniformly cratered, it has some areas that are very heavily old cratered areas, and then it has these oval or polygonal shaped regions where the surface has been disrupted, replaced with, uh, with newer material in very strange tectonic patterns. There are large fault systems running across the whole surface of the planet. Miranda has a cliff overlooking one of its valleys, which stands 16 miles above the base. Were you to throw a rock off the top of this cliff, it would take nine minutes before it hit the bottom. Phenomenal indeed. When Herschel first announced his discovery of Uranus, he felt that he had simply expanded the known solar system by about a billion miles. Until that time, it was believed that the solar system ended at Saturn. What he had truly done, however, is unveil one of the universe's great mysteries. Then there is Neptune. Very little is actually known about the eighth planet. Orbiting 30 times farther than the Earth from the sun, Neptune is most certainly a very cold place. Well, we knew very little about Neptune's atmosphere just a few years ago. We're now learning that it's a very active atmosphere, much like Jupiter's atmosphere. It has bands, has bright bands, dark bands, it has bright clouds and dark clouds. And Neptune's atmosphere is very exciting because it changes all the time. Every rotation you look, you have a different cloud feature will appear. And the features that were there previously are gone. Uh, and that's something that we've seen on, on Jupiter, for example. The clouds there are very dynamic and they change all the time. Neptune has a very thick atmosphere. Uh, it, you couldn't breathe it. Uh, you couldn't go and land on that atmosphere. You couldn't land on the planet. Uh, it's, it's like Jupiter in that the atmosphere is very, very thick. So thick that it gets heavier and heavier until it turns into basically a liquid state. There's no surface that you could stand on and say, okay, I'm standing on Neptune. You can't do that on Neptune. It is almost exactly the same size as Uranus, though it is not tipped on its side. Its orbital axis is a relatively calm 28 degrees. The analysis of Neptune has shown that it is made up of a solid core of rock and water ice, but there appears to be evidence of methane ice as well. This would indicate that the temperature of the planet is some 200 degrees below zero. Nonetheless, the measured radiation from the planet is greater than that which can be accounted for by the meager amount of sunlight that strikes it. That is, Neptune, mysteriously, is giving off more heat than it is receiving from the sun. Even amidst temperatures cold enough to freeze natural gas into blocks of ice, some process is taking place which generates heat. No one is yet quite sure what it is. We're not sure why Neptune's atmosphere radiates more heat than it gets from the sun. Maybe a better question to ask is why Uranus doesn't have an internal heat source. Because all the major planets that we work with, Jupiter and Saturn, both have internal heat sources and Neptune. So three out of our four major planets do have internal heat sources. Uranus without one is really the oddball, not Neptune for having one. And that heat source comes from a number of things. It, it comes from the gravitational contraction of the planet when it was originally formed. As you have a lot of material and mass in the primitive solar nebula before we had planets, as this mass contracted to form the planet, the contraction released energy, and the, and the energy is still stored up in the planet as it's forming. And the planet that we have now still has residual energy left over. And that is a part of its internal energy source. Neptune's atmosphere is much more dynamic than scientists had imagined. There appears a huge storm in the atmosphere, very similar to Jupiter's great red spot, and as such has been appropriately dubbed the great dark spot. 
Above and below this storm, there are numerous small white clouds which travel with and against the wind current, which have been called scooters. As Neptune is the most recently visited planet, and in fact the last planet on Voyager's tour, scientists at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory will be sifting through billions of bits of data over the next 100 years to discover the true nature of the last giant planet of our solar system. This much can be said for Neptune. It possesses two large satellites, Triton, which is about 2,000 miles in diameter and is coated with methane ice, and Nereid, which is barely larger than an asteroid at 185 miles in diameter. Triton, obviously the larger of the two, is also the most fascinating. Its orbit is completely opposite that of the rotation of Neptune. As it passes very close to the planet's surface, it no doubt raises tremendous waves of liquid methane which follow the moon on its orbit. This in turn slows down the satellite and causes it to come ever closer to the surface. One interesting thing about Triton is that, uh, well you probably know that for, the, in the case of the Earth's moon, the Earth's moon is very slowly spiraling out away from the Earth. In the case of Triton, um, the planet and the moon are going in different rotational directions, and so it's ever so slowly spiraling in. Eventually, Triton will slow to a point where its centrifugal force will be insufficient to retain it in orbit, and then it will begin its catastrophic fall into the very heart of Neptune. No one is quite sure what effect a huge body such as Triton will have falling into a planet as large as Neptune, but most assuredly, it will be quite a spectacle to witness. With the discovery of Uranus, mathematics was utilized to hypothesize the location of the eighth planet, Neptune. Amazingly, it was calculated and predicted to be in almost its exact position. From there, the mathematicians began to calculate again and advanced theories of where the ninth planet should be. One man, Percival Lowell, relying on faulty data, predicted the location of planet X and estimated that it would be very large. Lowell never found planet X, but the search continued. In 1928, a young astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh, after months of painstaking observation and analysis, found planet X, amazingly close to where Lowell said it would be. The planet was named Pluto, after the god of hell. It is interesting to note, however, that the first two letters of the name are Percival Lowell's initials. I imagine that picture would probably be like a cratered surface on Pluto due to impacts, but white uh, due to the frozen uh, uh, methane frost on the surface, making it rather highly reflective. And of course, with the craters and all, and then there'd be Pluto's moon up in the sky, if you're on that side of Pluto, because it makes the same, uh, uh, same period of revolution as the rotation of Pluto. Pluto's different. Pluto, little old Pluto, and it's out at the edge of the solar system again, is a small planet, rocky, icy kind of planet, not a gas giant at all. We're talking small. People have been doing some very interesting work studying the light that is reflected from Pluto. Pluto is much too far away for us ever to take images of it. All we can see is just a tiny point. We can't see that it's a planet. The only way we know it's a planet is by tracking it in the sky and seeing its motion around the sun. That's how it's defined as a planet. But there have been some very interesting discoveries just in the last year about Pluto. One of them is what is called a stellar occultation. This is where a star, from our view, disappears behind the planet and reappears. What's really happening is Pluto is moving. The star is fixed and we're looking at it. Pluto moves in front of the star and then the starlight is occulted and then the starlight reappears when Pluto moves out. Now if Pluto were a solid body, you'd expect the starlight to just wink out and then wink back again when Pluto crossed in front of it. But what happened instead is the starlight dimmed down and then disappeared. And then when the star reappeared, it, it brightened up slowly. In other words, it, there wasn't a sharp edge there. And that means that Pluto must have some kind of an atmosphere. And this, this is brand new. No one had suspected that. 
Pluto turns out to be much smaller than Lowell predicted and too small to cause any significant deviations in the orbit of Neptune. In fact, Pluto is so small that many believe that it shouldn't be called a planet at all. Its diameter is only 1,500 miles, about one half that of our moon, and that it is made up mostly of methane ice with a little rock thrown in for good measure. Pluto does have a satellite though, so it has managed to hold its rank as a planet thus far. The satellite is called Charon and wasn't found until 1978. Charon is about 475 miles in diameter and orbits Pluto once every 6.4 days, matching exactly the rotation of its parent, so that on Pluto, the moon is always in the same spot in the sky and the sun, shining dimly like a distant star, lies some three billion kilometers away. After Neptune Voyager, we'll just head on out of the solar system. It would take too much energy, too much fuel to turn around and bring it back. And I don't think we want to. Um, I'm really kind of proud to be one of the generation that has sent something away from the Earth, never to return. I mean, who knows where it's going to be billions of years from now. But it's a little piece of our generation, our culture, that's just out there leaving. and. It's maybe it's the first step of mankind out from our solar system. And that, I think that's exciting. be able to get data back until something like 2015 or something like that. Um, the kind of data that we will take is we will be looking at electric and magnetic fields. We have a cosmic ray detector on board. We uh, can detect particles like electrons and protons and it's interesting to see what the environment is like out there. It is unlikely that we will take the time to explore Pluto and Charon, <laughs> simply too far away and much too cold for us. So where do we go from here? To what end do we continue to explore the planets? We as a civilization are getting big enough that we can and are affecting our own planet. And some of those effects are not very good. We need to understand how a planet works, what it does when you touch it, what it does when you heat it, what it does when you cool it. And in order to do that, we have to have more than just earthly data. We have to have enough data about our sister planet Venus and our sister planet Mars and the other planets to understand how this generic planet works. If we don't do that, then we face a possible extinction of the species. And I can't think of a more important reason to do anything. A lot of times people ask me, what good is it that what you're doing? I mean, why bother studying Neptune or, or the outer planets? I mean, what do they tell you about Earth here? You know, we have a lot of problems here on Earth. Why, why study all that stuff out there? And there's, there's two things you can answer. One is the, the technology question, all right? By studying another planet's atmosphere, we can learn about our atmosphere. We can learn about chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, and why we shouldn't have aerosol hairspray. You know, we, by studying chemistry of other planets, we learn more about the chemistry of our planet, and, and that's an important thing. Aside from those kinds of questions, though, there's the broader question of, of knowledge. I mean, what do, what's man's purpose? It's to learn, to grow, to expand. 
and studying our closest neighbors in the universe, the other planets, is, I personally think, an important first step for understanding the universe. Of all, the most compelling reason is to gain a better understanding of our own Earth. For the other eight planets and their moons offer us an excellent sample of the diversity of environments and geologic evolutions that take place in the solar system. In some instances, their study provides us with details of what could go wrong with our own planet. And then there is the search for life. So far, everything we have encountered besides Earth, this lonely corner of the universe, is dead. Either it is ice or rock or gas, but it is not alive. Now, we do know of places where there may be life, or at least the, the potential is there. We must look and see. Sixty-four million years ago, an entire class of living organisms perished upon this planet, never to be seen again, because they lacked the ability to foresee changes in the environment in which they lived. And as such, they were unable to adapt when the need arose. Now this, this is a trilobite, a marine animal that lived on the Earth tens of millions of years ago. It and the dinosaurs are gone. Only these fossilized remains are here for us to see. This beach is full of remnants of creatures who have gone before us once. Once they were masters of the globe, once. Now we must not be like the dinosaurs. We must investigate any and all possibilities of life elsewhere to see how that life adapted to its own unique set of environmental pressures in order to assure that we can survive any changes to our planet. We must also look for other places to live, to explore. Man is not by nature a sedentary creature. We've always been nomads, traveling the world, journeying into uncharted territory, creating a place for ourselves to live and grow, regardless of the odds. There are very few challenges for exploration left on our home planet. Space and the other planets in our solar system are clearly in our future. But wherever our travels take us, we should always remember the Earth so this is the planet that gave us birth, cared for us, 
and gave us the ability to dream. And dream we must, for it is only by holding on firmly to our dreams that we can truly reach for the stars.